in your Bible to Mark chapter 2, verse 1. Our, our sermon title tonight is, We Must um, Care. And I know that you've heard it said before. Uh, this is kind of a, almost a trite phrase that we say many times. But uh, people don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. Have you heard that before? I mean, it's one of those cliche type phrases that we hear uh, often, but if there was ever one that was true, it's this one. So we're going to be looking at Mark uh, chapter, uh, chapter 2, we're going to be starting in verse 1. Uh, read with me, we're going to re be reading through verse 12. It says, And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, thank you uh, just for today, for your blessings. Uh, thank you for the wonderful day you've given us in your house. Uh, Father, I, I, just, I just pray when we gaze uh, upon Jesus and everything he means in our lives that we can say we never saw anything like this. We love you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now this entire story that we just read happened in this uh, little sleepy fishing village in Capernaum. Uh, and I want you to imagine for a moment, just use your imaginations and that you're there. And I want you to imagine, I mean, it's a beautiful setting. It's actually on the north edge of the Sea of Galilee. And there's a house there. And this house is jammed with people because Jesus is there. And, and it says, you know, they heard that he was in the house. And he's preaching and teaching. And the people have come in and they're, there's, there's no way to get in the door. They're crammed in. They're looking in through the windows. And Jesus is there in this house. And he's sharing uh, the word of God. I got this image up here. Uh, Will, will you go ahead and put it? I hope you can see that. This would have been a typical Jewish dwelling place uh, during Jesus' time. Uh, in Capernaum, in that fishing village where the Jews lived, it probably would have been a, you can see, it's hard for you to see from there, but there's actually a, a wall there, and there's other dwelling spaces, living spaces behind that. But this is kind of typical of what a Jewish home might have looked like uh, during that time. Um, it would have been made of stone. Um, the roof would have been covered over, first of all, mostly with small saplings. And those saplings would be overlaid with palm branches. And those palm branches, which were larger, would be thatched and held together with mud. With mud. And then perhaps on top of that, many times they would add tiles laying on top of each other for the water to run off. Um, and so that this would be a typical house. This is what it would look like. And I would imagine it was something like that in this little sleepy fishing village of Capernaum. Now, you've seen the scene, but uh, on the map, I, I didn't put the map up there, but there's the Sea of Galilee, and here's Capernaum, and, and the house is in the city right there, and so it's a beautiful place. And there's the crowds, the multitudes, they're all around. And, of course, like the Scripture said, they heard that he was in the house. It's because Jesus is inside teaching, and the air is filled with excitement. You know, I believe this, that... that Church and excitement are not exclusive of each other. I mean, I think we ought to be excited to come to church. Um, and and I, I, I always am, but sometimes I wonder why we think these two things are exclusive. I, I don't think um, 
I think we should come to worship service with a sense of expectancy. What, what's going to happen? What, what's going to happen today? Uh, what, how, what is God going to say to me? And I don't think we ought to be satisfied with small crowds either. I, 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 that's not biblical. Uh, show me a verse. Amen? Find a Bible verse for that. I've not, I, I don't see it. Uh, we should never put the, down the idea of crowds. I don't think we should be satisfied. Uh, when Elijah preached, the Bible said that all of Israel went out to hear Elijah preach. And when John the Baptist preached, the great crowds came to the River Jordan uh, to hear John the Baptist. And on the day of Pentecost, you know this, that 3,000 people got saved and baptized. So how many more thousands of people must have been there? Big crowds. So don't put down the idea of large crowds. Uh, it should never be our goal to grow a big church. Uh, and it should never be our goal to have a little one. Amen? It should be our goal to see lost men saved. And if our church sees lost men and women saved, the church is going to grow. It's a natural, nat just a natural progression. We should desire that lost people are saved. So we have to have a compassion. What did you, Jesus saw the what? The multitude. And we must have a compassion for the multitude as well. I mean, I'm sure if I asked you, don't you want to see many, many people to hear the word of God and get saved? You would say yes. But then you might say, but not in my pew. Amen? <laughs> right? And many times, and I've been, the Lord's dealt with me this lately because, you know, preachers get so focused on numbers, don't they? Shake your head like this. Right? Yeah, they do. Amen? And, and, and so, um, and I always kind of battle that. Like, I don't want to, just study numbers all the time. How many's here? How many's that? You know, that's not important. But I would be lying if I said that I wasn't concerned with numbers. That wouldn't be true either. I'm not all consumed, but I'm certainly concerned. And and many of you might would say, well, numbers in church don't mean nothing to me. Numbers, numbers just aren't important. Well, if that's true for you, I want to see you after service. I've got some one dollar bills I want to change for your tens. Amen. Because numbers are not important. But what, what, I, what, I've, you know, what we've always known, but what we need to realize is, is that numbers represent souls that Jesus died for. That's the number of their souls that Jesus died for. And, and I believe that it would be just sinful and wicked to be content to let the, the stadiums and the theaters have the crowds and not be concerned about having a crowd at church. We need to get multitudes of people on our hearts. You know, maybe you're thinking right now, well, Brother Marcus, how big, you know, how big is big enough? How big is big enough for a church, do you think? How big should a church be? Um, I looked it up this morning. There are 6.93 billion people in the world, roughly. 6.93 billion people. When every one of those people are saved, the church is big enough. Amen? And I'll tell you what, it's going to take a whole lot of Smyrna Baptist churches around the world to make that happen. But we should have the multitudes on our heart. Uh, we're going to have to get that. Uh, just Jesus had compassion on the multitude. Anyway, so there were crowds there. And Jesus is uh, teaching, and they're all around that house. They're trying to get in, and then suddenly there's the, the, the noise on the ceiling. You know, there's the cracking noise, and Jesus is talking, and, and the tiles start falling or whatever, and it's, 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 debris starts falling, and then uh, they look up, and there's a crack in the ceiling, and uh, a man's hands come through. Then after a while, they begin to tear the ceiling back. Uh, then you can see four faces looking down at the crowd, and the crowd looking up at four faces. Could you imagine if that happened in church? <laughs> But anyway, I'm so, and, and then down through the ceiling there comes this man. He's being lowered on these ropes. He's on a pallet being lowered on ropes right there in front of Jesus. And then when Jesus saw this man and Jesus saw uh, what had happened, uh, he saw the faith of these people who brought the man. Jesus looked at the man that was paralyzed and, and he, he, he was palsied is what it was. And Jesus said to him, uh, look at Mark chapter 2 verse 5. Jesus said this. He, says, he saw their faith. He said to the paralytic son, your sins are are forgiven you. And then there's people there that when they heard this, when they heard Jesus say, your sins are forgiven, uh, they're all the great theologians that were there in the crowd, and they said, how, how can you say that? You don't have the right, you don't have the prerogative to forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. And I, I think Jesus is going, duh, yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that's right. Uh, only God can forgive sins, and of course Jesus was God. 
And that's the story. And as Jesus forgives the man's sins, he says, I just want you to know that I have the power and the authority to forgive sins. So I, which is harder, to forgive sins or to say to a paralyzed man, get up and walk? And so he told the man, he said, get up, take your bed and walk. And the most important thing that happened in this story, this true story that we just read, was not that the man was healed of his palsy, of his uh, paralysis, but that it was the fact that the man was saved spiritually. That's the story. The, the, the fact that he was healed from being paralyzed is just a backdrop for the story of this man being miraculously saved of his sins and forgiven. Now, the title of our message tonight is We Must Care. So what does this say to, the, uh, to us? What does this We Must Care, what does this sermon tonight say to me as the pastor of Smyrna? You, uh, what does it say to the heart of Smyrna Baptist, who we are as people? You know, we have a good many more people that come on Sunday morning. You know, um, but I think it's wonderful that you come on Sunday night because I believe that when you come on Sunday night, it means that you are especially concerned. Uh, hopefully, with your church and with your kingdom, uh, the kingdom of God, and and with this community. But what does the story say to me? What does it say to you? Well, I, it says four things, and this is number one. The first thing is this: we are to bring all men to Jesus Christ. We are to bring all men. To Jesus Christ. This is for they brought this man on the stretcher and they could have said, Well, this isn't our problem. You know, old Bobby over there, he's been like that all his life. It's not our problem. But it was their concern and it's our concern. There's this teaching going around today, this hyper Calvinism. I don't know if it's called hyper Calvinism because it's more Calvinistic than John Calvin, the man that it's named after. Uh, but they have this idea that God want, doesn't want everybody saved, that God has already predetermined some people for heaven and some people for hell. That God in the council halls of eternity uh, already preordained some people to go to heaven and some people to go to hell. And this is hyper Calvinism. Uh, but I read this in the Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 6. It says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires... Will you say that those next two words with me out loud, please? It's like out loud day here at Smyrna. On the count of three. Say those next two words. It says, uh, Who desires one, two, three? All men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if you're, how up you are on your Greek, <laughs> but even in Greek, that says all men. It don't matter what language you look at. It, it says he desires that all men. Look at First John chapter two verse two. It says this, and he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Everybody. Now, they may have said, these guys carrying this paralyzed man, they might have said it's none of our business, but he was. They might have said that, you know, the, 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 God had predestined this man to be paralyzed and to die in his sins. That could have been their attitude. He's not really worth our effort, but he was worth it. And you, I, you and I need to see the value in people of one's soul. One soul's precious. Uh, we know this. It's almost we, we take this as trite that Jesus would have died for one soul, but it's true, and it's it's almost too true and too big of a concept for us to wrap our minds around that Jesus would have did all of that for one soul. Now I know that you're glad that somebody told you about Jesus. Somebody did, um, and I know that you're glad that somebody brought you to Jesus. And I think we should be careful. Never call any man or woman or child in this city, uh, in this church, in this community, in this county, in this state, never call anybody worthless. Right? Because Jesus died for them too. It, and, and it's not on our slides, but 1 Timothy 2, 4, it tells us that Christ gave him a, himself a ransom for all. For all. For everyone. For everyone. And some years ago, I read, read about this woman, and she was in Paris, France, and it was many, many, many years ago, and she was dressed elegantly. And, and she had this beautiful, like, ballroom dress on, and she had the white gloves up to here, right? And she had this big, fat diamond ring on her finger, uh, outside the gloves, you know, so you could see it. And she was in the, in the streets there in Paris, and um, she went to pull her glove off, right? And, and she forgot she had the ring on, and that big, expensive diamond ring fell down into the gutter. 
right there. Now, like I said, this is many, many, many years ago, but and they didn't have the kind of sewage systems that we have today. So when it fell in the gutter, it fell in the muck and the mire, and it was nasty, right? And so she took her other gloved hand and, and tried to kind of fish around for it, and she couldn't get it and just cover it up. So finally in her elegant ballroom dress, silk, and she finally hitched up her dress, right, got, took her other glove off and got down and dug around in that muck and, and finally pulled that diamond ring out. Why did she do that? She did it because it was valuable to her. It was valuable to her. And she was willing to get down in the muck and the mire to get her ring. And we as a church need to see people as valuable. That we're willing to get down in the muck and the mire of their lives and, and tell them about Jesus. Because they're valuable. Right? They, listen, these guys that were carrying this guy, they could have said it's none of our business. He's worthless. Uh, but there's this man uh, I've been reading lately, Dr. R.A. Torrey. You've probably heard of him. He's a great the theologian and great man of God of the past. And, and um, he's, he said this, and I want you to listen to this. He said, I would like to know what right a man has to call himself a follower of Jesus Christ if he is not a soul winner. Right? And so if we took a survey in here tonight and said, how many of you are followers of Jesus Christ? Me, right? And then I would say, how many of you would classify yourself as a soul winner? That number would drop drastically. See, Dr. Lee Scarborough, he was a one-time president of a Southwestern Baptist Theological uh, Seminary way back when, when it was just a new seminary. And he said this, to refuse to witness the saving gospel to a lost world day by day. In other words, he's saying, as it's a part pattern in your life, to refuse to witness the saving gospel to a lost world day by day is nothing short of high treason. It's treason against your king, against Jesus. The great commission has become the great omission and it's turned into treason. In many of our lives, it's true. Uh, it doesn't matter how much money you give to the church. Uh, it, it doesn't matter how faithfully you attend worship services. Uh, it doesn't matter how circumspectly you walk. You, you live a good moral life. Uh, it doesn't matter how eloquently you teach. It doesn't matter how beautifully you sing. If you're not endeavoring or if it's not on your heart to see lost people saved, then you're living in treason against the king of kings. It's true. How can a person call himself a follower of Jesus Christ if your heart doesn't beat for the same things that his heart beats after? Lost and dying souls. So we're to bring all men to Jesus Christ. Now I've kind of broke this up. We'll go ahead and put that slide up there. Categories of persons present. I just want to look at the people that are in this story just briefly. And the first one is the, the helpless. There was the paralyzed man. He was, he was helpless. He couldn't come unless somebody brought him. And there's and when we think about bringing people to our church, you say, Brother Marcus, we built these buildings, and we've got our programs, and, and the church is up. They know where we are if they need us. Right? And, and you're like, so why don't they come? If they want to be saved, why don't they come? I'll tell you why they don't come. It's because they're paralyzed, just like this man. They're, they're, they're paralyzed. They're paralyzed by sin. They're paralyzed by prejudice. Uh, they're paralyzed by ignorance about the church. And unless we go get them and bring them in, they simply cannot come. They don't know how. Many of them. They're helpless. Now, you may not think that they're helpless. And you might think, well, if they want to come, they can come. But listen, they, some, the Bible tells us this, and, and this isn't on the slide either, but over Romans it says, there's none that seek after God. Not one. And that's in Romans. There's none that seek after God. All right, so the helpless. Number two, we have these guys, the hinderers. The hinderers. Uh, that's just another category of the people there. Not only were they helpless, but they were hinderers. There were people who were just standing around the door, listening to the message, right? They just couldn't get in because of those people that were standing around the house, around the doors and the windows. And these people that were just standing around were actually hindering this man from being saved. They were in the way. And the ones who were hindering people from being saved were the ones, they're just, they're listening to the sermon. They're listening to Jesus. And they're, they're the onlookers. They're the spectators, uh, the bench warmers. 
they, they weren't even aware of the need of this paralyzed man. Did you know that sometimes there are people that come into this church and they're lost people, many times strangers and visitors, and can you believe that they want to sit in our seats? Those people sitting in my seat, right? I mean, come on. If you haven't been there, you haven't been coming to church long enough, amen? They come in and sit in my, can you believe the nerve of these people? To think they can come in here and sit in my seat. I've been coming to church here 20 years. Right? That's why I sit close to the front so nobody take my seat. Amen. But there was this man there who was lost. And these guys are trying to get him to Jesus, but they can't because of these hinderers. They were there. They were listening, sitting there, listening to the message. And they're hindering this man getting to the Lord. I heard about a girl one time. She couldn't make up her mind about who she wanted to marry. Uh, she, she had these three men. There's one man that owned a grocery store. She liked him a lot, thought she might love him, but she, she didn't know if she wanted to marry him, him or not because there was this other guy. And the other guy owned a dress shop. And she liked him pretty good, and, and they got along pretty good, but she didn't know if she wanted to marry him or not because there's this other man that was a preacher, and he was a handsome devil, let me tell you. And, and so there's this, there's this preacher. And so she, who do I marry, the grocer, the dress, the shop owner, or, or the preacher? And she said this to herself. She said, you know, I've got a real problem. If I marry the grocer, then I could eat for nothing. If I marry the man that owns the dress shop, then I, then I can dress for nothing. But if I marry that preacher, I can be good for nothing. Amen? Baby, that has nothing to do with you, okay? But there are a lot of people that are like that. They're good. They're good. They come to church, they're good, but they're good for nothing. Good people. Good people. Number three. So the helpless, the hinderers. The third group of people that was there are the hellish. The hellish. Uh, not only were there uh, all these other people there, these are people who actually got upset because this old vile sinner got saved and they didn't like it. The hellish. They actually criticized Jesus. I mean, I've talked about this before, but there's some people in all churches that think they have the spiritual gift of criticism. I mean, there are people in every church that feel God has appointed them and to anointed them to point out everything that's wrong, to criticize everything, right? Did you notice that the slides weren't working this morning? Well, I did too, amen. I was up here. Thank you for telling me on the way out the door. <laughs> Right? I hope none of you did that, but if it was you, hey, let the Lord deal with you. Amen. I'm just saying, some of us think that's our spiritual gift, is to criticize and to gripe and to groan. I mean, I, listen, I promise you that sermon, the sermon wasn't the best sermon you've ever heard because it came from me, but I promise you it came from the Word of God. And if you walked out of here this morning with any idea of anything else than the fact that God loves you and that you're valuable, lovable, capable, forgivable, and all of these things, and you walk out of here and complain, you need to confess. Yes! <laughs> you need to repent and get saved. <laughs> or get right. I don't understand. Right? God's Word tells us how valuable one, and, and we, we, we read these verses and we get this in our head and then it's like, man, God really loves me. Then you walk out the door and you're like, that preacher's stupid or that it's too hot, it's too cold, the singing... It was awful. The single singing's better than ever. The the choir. Why were they sitting up there? What's going on? You know, it's just. And if if that's the first, if if as soon as the preacher gets done preaching, and you feel the first thing that you need to do when you see him is to complain, you need to know that the preacher's praying for you. The preacher's praying for you. Dwight L. Moody had a heart for God. I pray for you anyway, but I'm praying for you by name now. Amen. But listen, Dwight L. Moody had a heart for God. Y'all heard of D.L. Moody. I mean, I know we're not all theologians and all studied up, but D.L. Moody, had, this man was passionate, was on fire, and had a heart for God. And one time, uh, he had this literary critic, this um, um, educated man, if you will. He came up to him and said, Sir, do you know that tonight you had 38 grammatical errors in your sermon?" And D.L. Moody says, well, you know, I didn't have a formal education of any kind. And uh, um, he said, 
I, I just haven't had much education. I'm doing the best I can with what I got. Amen. He said, be honest with you, I probably made more than 38 grammatical errors in my sermon. And he said, but sir, let me ask you, he said, what are you doing with all this knowledge that you have for Jesus? Right? If we have that critical spirit and we can always pick out what's wrong, what are you doing to fix those things? Right? And what are you, what are you doing to, to serve Jesus through this gift that he's given you? We must serve. I heard about a preacher one time. He was preaching. <laughs> and he mentioned the, words, the word pants in his sermon. This was many years ago. And he mentioned the word pants. Uh, it was like an illustration or something like that. And this lady came up to him afterwards and she said, Do you realize that tonight, it was an evening service, said, Do you realize tonight that you said a very inelegant word? Right? And he's like, Well, what did I say? I'm sorry. And she said, You used the word pants. And the guy's like, oh, I'm sorry, what should I say? She said, it would have been better if you used the word trousers. All right, and he said, well, I'm sorry. Well, thank you for that. Well, you know, I appreciate it. And uh, he said, but what did you think about the rest of the sermon? And she said, I don't remember anything else you said. And he said, well, if I hadn't have said pants, you wouldn't have remembered anything. So there's the, the hellish. And number four, these are the people that I want to be, I want you to be, the helpers. Uh, too often, I don't think I'm in this category enough. I want to be in this category a lot more. I want to be a helper and, and lose my attitude. It's the, help, the, the helpless were there, the hinderers were there. I, mean, I promise you, the hellish are always there. And I'll tell you who else was there that day, these helpers. These are the kind of people that we just got to be. This has to be our goal. They're the people who went out, they got a man, and they brought that man on a stretcher, and they brought that man to Jesus. I don't know their names, but I decided to give them some names. Will, bring their names up for me. The first guy's name is Mr. Compassion. Mr. Compassion. Um, he cared for this man that they brought on the stretcher. He had a heart of compassion, just like Jesus. When Jesus saw the multitudes and was moved with compassion, does it make any difference to you that are around this church and in our city, uh, in our state, in our nation, that there are hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that are going to die and go to hell without Jesus? Does that fill you with compassion? Our hearts need to be moved with compassion. There was a second guy, not just Mr. Compassion, but Mr. Confidence. I like this guy. Mr. Confidence. Uh, he believed that it could be done. I mean, there's always going to be people that say, hey, you can't do that. There's no way. We can't do it. It's too hard. It's too difficult. But here's a man who had faith. Look at Mark chapter 2, verse 5 again. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Whose faith did Jesus see? Look again. When he saw their faith, those four guys and the paralytics, when, it, when, when, when he saw their faith, all of them, he didn't, wasn't just looking at the, the paralyzed guy who got carried in on a stretcher. He, he sees the, the men that carried him. And he, he sees their faith and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And that's what Mr. Confidence can do. And I like this guy. He, he was Real faith is belief with legs on it. Mr. Confidence. The next one is this. Mr. Courage. I like this guy too. Uh, not, only, not only these other three there, but Mr. Courage. You know, this is a pretty bold thing to do. I mean, if somebody started tearing a hole through this church house, we'd have him whooped in 30 seconds, wouldn't we? Amen? Right? We'd have some deacon throwing his back up out there trying to get, hit somebody with a stick because they're digging a hole in the roof. Amen. Right? What would we, that would be natural. I'm not putting that down. I'd be holding them up. Get them! <laughs> Amen? <laughs> right? That would be the natural reaction. This guy had courage. I mean, it's just a courageous thing to do. They went up on a rooftop and they began to tear it apart. They to put a hole in this roof. Now, you think about it. They, they were willing to, to make a spectacle. I mean, I'm sure some people laughed at them. I'm sure some people complained. Uh, and quite a few of them must have thought, fanatics. That's my favorite one. Fanatics. Look at those fanatics. Did you know that we're not going to reach Chapel Hill or, or make a dent in our community uh, until we're willing to be courageous? 
until like you don't care anymore if people laugh at you unless you're willing to be called fools and freaks and fanatics and, and fundamentalists. Right? Um, it's not going to happen. We have people, they wouldn't, listen, we, have, we, we wouldn't think about tearing a hole through somebody's roof to get somebody to Jesus. Right? Because we're too ashamed. Listen, we'd read our Bible on lunch break if we weren't so embarrassed that somebody would see us reading it. Right? Uh, we, we, we're just, it freaks us out. We won't even pray for our food in a restaurant because we're afraid somebody will think that we're a fanatic. And we don't want anybody to think that we're 100% sold out for Jesus. Because if you are, that's just a little different from everybody else. And if you're, honestly, if you're 100% sold out for Jesus, that's going to make you a little bit different than for most people in church. You're going you're to kind of stand out a little bit. All right, so he was courageous. Nick, let's look at this next one. Mr. Compassion, Confidence, Mr. Courage, and Mr. Creativity. And that's who was on that fourth corner. I mean, that was a pretty good idea. I mean, would you agree? I mean, who thought of that? That's pretty creative to think, let's tear a hole in there. I mean, he says, well, I'll tell you what we do. We've got to go up. We'll tear a hole in the roof, and we're going to put some ropes on this bad boy, and we'll lower them down. And if we do it right here, it'll be right where Jesus is, right? That's a good idea. That's pretty slick because love's going to find a way. And this is what we need here in our church. I mean, our people need to be people of compassion and confidence, and we need to be courageous, and we need to be creative. We need to be creative to reach our community for Jesus. And so this is the first thing. Our first point, again, was we are to bring all men to Jesus. Point number two. We are to bring all men by all means to Jesus, whatever it takes. I mean, if it's not illegal, if it's not immoral, if we can do it, we need to do it. If it's not illegal, immoral, if we can do it, we need to do it. Somebody has once said that the seven last words of the church are these. We never did it that way before. Right? I got this quote from Agent Rogers. He says, come will or come woe, our status is quo. Amen. Uh, people don't like change. I mean, I don't think we ever ought Listen, you don't do the unusual to be unusual. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I mean, I'm pretty sure I have the idea that if they had broke a hole in that guy's roof and lowered that guy down when they could have got in the front door, Jesus would have got on to him. And we're not doing the unusual or the different just to be different. But it means that things can change, that we don't always have to do things the same way um, we've done them. I and mean, if we're going to reach people of different cultures and different backgrounds, listen, every single thing that Smyrna Baptist Church does, every program, everything that we do, uh, whether it's vacation Bible school, whether it's going to the Nashville Rescue Mission, uh, Sunday school, youth and children's program, whether it's our Mother's Day Out, our Mom's Day Out program, whatever it is, do you know what it is? It's just a stretcher to bring people to Jesus. That, that's what it is. That's what it has to be. And if it's not a stretcher to bring people to Jesus, we don't have any business doing it. No business at all. We're to bring all men by all means to Jesus. Number three, we are all to bring all men by all means to Jesus. All of us. We're all to do this. Uh, we, we need to do it together. I know many of you, oh, you've heard this uh, illustration before, but those Canadian geese, when they fly in those uh, V formations and, and how they can, uh, the ones up in the front, and somehow he's creating a vacuum for the rest of them. They can fly easier. As a matter of fact, some scientists have done some research in wind tunnels, and they say by that guy being up in the front like he is, he's cutting down on the, the drag for the rest of them by 72% or something like that. And so they can go much, much, much further together than they ever could apart. Well, that's us. We can do much, much, much more together than we can ever do on our own. And by the way, have you ever wondered why one leg of that V is always longer than the other? Me too. Amen. All right. I mean, I mean, are Canadian geese just fans of odd numbers? I don't know. Anyway, all right. Number four. If you've never wondered that, okay. All right, number four. Uh, we are to bring all men to Jesus by all means at all cost. At all cost. 
at all costs. Okay, so let's, the first thing was we're to bring all men to Jesus. The second thing is we're to use all means to bring all men to Jesus. The third thing, we need to use all means to bring all men. Uh, we are all to use all means to bring all men to Jesus. That means none of us are excluded. And the fourth and final thing is this. We are to bring all men. We are all to bring all men to Jesus by all means at all cost. Now, Jesus said, by proving what these when Jesus didn't get on to them, did he? And what he's saying is, people are more important than things. People are more important than property, is what Jesus was saying by his actions. And Jesus commended their faith. All right, he saw their faith. He said, Good job. Way to bust a hole through that roof. I mean, that's what he's saying for tearing through this roof. Now, I don't believe for a second that these guys didn't pay for it or fix it. I, I, I believe one of them, Mr. Creative, said, I know what you do. We'll climb up on this roof. We'll kick a hole in it, right? We'll lower this guy down. And then one of the guys said, whoa, man, that's not your roof, right? What are you? <laughs> you can't be busting holes in people's. And he said, no, I'll pay for it. Or he said, you know, my daddy's a roofer, amen. He's got stuff at the house. We can fix this. Right? We could take care of it. Whatever it was, I, I just, I absolutely don't believe they kicked a hole in somebody's roof and left it like that. Right? You see, if you're looking for a cheap way, an easy way to reach lost people, it doesn't exist. Did you know that almost anybody would reach and win souls if it didn't cost anything? We would all, we'd be doing it all the time if it didn't cost anything. And I'm just talking about financial costs. But there's, there's no cheap way, no easy way to do it. Uh, it may cost you a meal. It may cost you sleep. It may cost a day's wages. It may cost you um, friends. It may cost you status. Any Christian who's willing to suffer, willing to lose money, to lose friends, to willing to make a spectacle, spectacle of themselves like kicking a hole in somebody's roof can win souls for Jesus. And we absolutely must Win souls for Jesus. Because if we're not, what are we doing? Now you remember in this story, there's four people that I kind of categorized. Uh, there was the helpless man, right? He was paralyzed. He, was, he couldn't come unless he was brought. Then there was the hinderers. These were the bench warmers. These are the people that somehow thought that because they were sitting around listening to a sermon from Jesus, they were doing God a favor. That they were doing something wonderful. Then there was the hellish, those who criticized what God was doing in that house. And then there was the helpers. You know, the guy that says, I get this corner, you get that corner. Let's come on. The helpers. What I want you to do right now is categorize yourself I I don't necessarily know what category you fit in. Which one are you? I mean, honestly, tonight your biggest need could be that you need to get saved. Uh, that you need to have your sins forgiven. You're the paralyzed man. Maybe you need to be saved. And maybe you need Jesus to save you. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I don't. I, what could be better? Maybe you've been one of those that sit in, in Psalm 1, it, it describes as the, the seat of the scornful. Right, you're hypercritical. Uh, maybe tonight you need to ask God to forgive you of that attitude. Maybe you've been one of those who's just been a part of the crowd, right? Rather than helping people come to Jesus, if you really evaluated yourself, you'd have to admit you've been a hindrance, either through your behavior at church or on the job or, or whatever it is. So, which one are you? Are you the helpless? Are you a hinderer? Are you the hellish? I mean, just which one of these are you tonight? Will you bow your head and close your eyes? Uh, Father God, I, I just pray that you give us all a, a real, genuine, heartfelt compassion uh, to bring people to Jesus. Lord, that we might bring all men to Christ. Father, that we might use all means to bring all men to Christ. God, that we all might use all means to bring all men to Christ and that we might use all means at any cost. That we may 
all bring all men to Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.